Hello, this is Odette Hadas from Tracepan Communications, and today's video is an introduction to NGBond2. So before we go into NGBond2, let's look at a slide which was created more than 10 years ago, uh, which tried to illustrate the future of pod technologies. At that time, there was GPON and EPON. Uh, XGPON1 was already being standardized, so it was quite clear where this was going. And there were several directions that were taken as uh, as a next step, as well as some directions that were considered in parallel, like the WDM option, um, like NG.1 including the long reach option. Uh, the next generation had several, the next generation beyond XG.1 had several ideas. So let's look at some of the technologies that were considered and are still being considered as ideas to expand GPON for providing more reach, more throughput, and better performance. So one idea is just expansion of the TDMA PON technology. It means take GPON and use similar principles for higher rates and also higher power budgets to enable higher split ratios which means more customers on a pawn. The second idea is WDM pawn. Uh, WDM pawn actually means you have a pawn in terms of the physical topology, which means a tree topology, a tree fiber network, but every ONU has its own uh, wavelength, which means it's actually a separate channel. So from the protocol point of view, it's point to point with the OLD. These ONUs don't interfere with, with each other. Um, the main advantage of this is simplified MAC layer because the ONUs don't need to share any resources at the MAC layer. Higher bandwidth per customer because each one gets a full pawn. And independency among customers or lack no independency among customers. But the main challenges are the high cost of optical components and their sensitivity to temperature changes because within a given spectrum, you need to use several different or a large number of wavelengths depending on the number of ONUs and temperature changes may uh, cause shift in the wavelength and this way some ONUs may collide with each other. Uh, TWDM combines the two. It takes several pawns which are tree topology pawns, TDMA pawns, which have the same fiber infrastructure, but they use separate wavelengths. So this way, you don't need as many wavelengths as in pure WDM pawn, um, and you have the good of both worlds. So this is NG.2. Let's start with the highlights of NG.2, and then we will uh, explain exactly how the TWDM works. So the aggregate rates are downstream 4 gigabits per second. Upstream has two flavors, 10 or 40. It's achieved by stacking for XGPON1-like or XGSPON-like, which means very similar to XGPON1 or XGSPON, uh, but with some differences, which we'll talk about. Uh, put them on a single fiber using a multiple wavelength in the TWDM PON technology, which means time and wavelength division. Uh, there are some new flow messages, and this is the main difference in terms of the protocol between XGPON1 and XGSPON and NG.2. Uh, these PLO messages support the wavelength tuning and handover of processes. Um, NG.2 is coexistence with GPON, XG.1 and XGSPON, and that's thanks to different wavelengths, so they can run side by side on the same optical distribution network, and this allows cohabitation and easy migration between the technologies. So this diagram describes what a TWDM PON looks like or specifically what ng.2 looks like. Uh, the OLT has four wavelengths in the downstream and can receive four wavelengths in the upstream. Uh, these wavelengths are multi multiplexed with the WDM MUX. And before the splitter, you actually have the four lambdas downstream and the four lambdas upstream. The ONUs are universal, which means there is no uh, ONU that is dedicated to a set of wavelengths, but rather, they have tunable optics. So uh, an ONU sees all the downstream wavelengths, but then can tune into one of them. And in the upstream, it tunes itself to the relevant upstream. So 
every ONU receives one channel downstream and and transmits one channel upstream. Uh, what we actually get is some is like four independent pawns because every ONU that or if the group of ONUs that share the same wavelengths are actually a pawn that uses um, a pawn protocol. Other than that, they're independent of the other ONUs. So it's like we have separate pawns overlaid on the same uh, infrastructure. The only, um, I would say, the, the only common um, resource or the, or the only place where they interact is where you need to uh, assign the wavelength test or hand over the wavelength test. Because if an ONU moves from one set of wavelength to a different one, it actually leaves one pawn and joins another pawn. There's a process defined in the standard, the standard G989.3. This is the NG.2 standard. It defines how the handover works. Uh, there's a source OLT CT, there's a target OLT CT. So actually the ONU moves from one to the other. Uh, there's some communication between these two OLTs. Uh, there is communication first between the source and the ONU. And then after the ONU moves, it communicates with the target OTCT. I will not get into the details of this, but what's important is there's a certain process which defines the handover. As you can see, there are messages here called tuning request and tuning acknowledge. These are the messages that are interchanged or exchanged between the OLT and the ONU for the handover process. And here we can see examples of what these messages look like. Uh, these, this is actually the coding that is done by Trace Pants Analyzer. We have an NG.2 analyzer, so you can see that this is the tuning control. This is a downstream message coming from the OLT to the ONU. And you can see the decoding of the different fields. There are some parameters here that define what needs to be done. Um, and I think the most important one is the, down, the target pawn ID, which actually defines the target channel to which the ONU needs to switch to. And this is the tuning response, which also has quite a lot of fields. I will not get into all of this, but as you can see, the operation code response is ACK, which means the ONU accepted this message. Uh, another note about the NG.2 standard. Uh, NG.2 standard also defines a point-to-point -point WDM pawn, point-to-point -point in terms of the protocol. Of course, it's spawn, so it's a tree topology. Um, this is not, this is a totally different protocol and a different technology, uh, but for various reasons, it's specified within the same standard. So just as a note, uh, some of the vendors that do NG.2 TWDM pawn don't deal with point-to-point -point WDM pawn. Um, there are some challenges, mainly the cost of the optics and their sensitivity to temperature, which uh, right now is making this not a very common technology, the point-to-point WDM pawn, but it is specified. Okay, let's look at the wavelength assignment. Um, just to get an idea of how the spectrum is used for different technologies. As you can see, there are the dedicated g pawn wavelengths. There are wavelengths for XG pawn 1 and XGS pawn, which are the same because the both can actually share the same pawn. XG pawn 1 and XGS pawn ONUs can talk with an XGS pawn, can communicate with an XGS pawn OLT. So that the downstream and the upstream. Uh, there's the analog overlay from G pawn. And then for NG pawn 2, there are actually uh, ranges of wavelengths that can be used for downstream and for upstream. There's also another range for the point-to-point. -point. Um, as you can see, there is a rather narrow spectrum in which you need to fit in the four wavelengths in each direction. And this is one of the challenges with the NG.2 optics, the fact that they have to be relatively sensitive and relatively accurate, um, especially compared to the other technologies like g or xg one xgs -Pon because their sensitivity, if you have a drift in the wavelength, um, the risk is that you will tune into a different wavelength. Uh, so this is one of the things that makes the optics more complicated. The other thing is the tunability, because the ONU needs to be able to tune to a different wavelength, which means tunable optics 
which are a challenge of themselves. Uh, now, if we look at the history, and I will explain why I'm showing this in a minute. Um, going back to 2011, there was GPON as a relevant technology already commercially available, uh, deployments available, and the industry started looking at the next step. XG.1 was standardized, but XG.1 wasn't a big leap compared to G.1. It was four times as much bandwidth in the downstream, two times as much in the upstream. And many, uh, many of the companies, the service providers and the vendors in the industry thought that you need something beyond this. And if you remember the slide we showed first with some migration diagram, uh, they already started looking at NGPON2. In 2012, FSAN defined the architecture for NGPON2, which is based on the TWDM PON. Uh, but then the industry waited for this to be standardized and to be commercially available. It took three years for the standards to be ratified. And even then, it wasn't really commercially available. I mean, there were some prototypes, but the main challenge was the optics, which were still and are still today um much higher cost than the industry can accept or in other words this is not these are not costs that allow commercial deployment because of this uh, since the industry has been waiting for some years for ng2 to mature uh, they decided to come up with a new standard called xgs pawn and that was in 2016. xgs pawn actually takes ng2 goes back and removes the four wavelengths so the protocol is actually like NG.2 with the removal of the web and the tuning mechanisms. And uh, this is actually something which is now being adopted very widely, with some people viewing NG.2 as the next step. Now, a little bit about what's beyond NG.2. The ITU and IEEE are exploring ideas for new PON technologies that support 25 gigs and 50 gigs per PON. This is on a single wavelength. Some vendors have already announced pre-standard prototypes of these. Now, the main driver for these higher bandwidths is the backhaul for 5G wireless networks. And this is a much stronger driver than the requirements of business and, of course, residential customers because the bandwidth that XGS PON could provide today is probably more than enough, at least for the coming years. But 5G, you have a base station that serves many customers, requires backhauling. This requires much higher bandwidth, and that's the driver. Regarding the opportunities and challenges for service providers, NG PON2, as we, as we mentioned in two slides ago, uh, took long to develop. The architecture was defined in 2012, was defined in 2012. The standard was only ratified in 2015, and in 2019 today, the cost of optics is still very high. It's delaying mass deployment. There are a small number of service providers that are seriously evaluating and even have have pilot deployments of NG.2, but the majority is still waiting because it's not cost effective. For several years, service providers had to choose between proceed with XG.1 or wait for NG.2 to mature. In many ways, XGS PON solved this problem. And there are still service providers who are deploying GPON today, and probably XGS PON will be their next steps, but it's still their next step. So that's it for today. Um, thank you for watching this video. If you'd like to learn more about these technologies and others, you're welcome to visit our our uh, website, tracecon.com category webinars. We have a number of longer and more detailed webinars about the technology. You can learn more about our company in tracepan, www.tracepan.com, or contact us at info at tracepan.com. If you like this video, like it, and you're welcome to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you again.